Welcome to Taking IVR from Good to Great, our 32nd monthly event covering technical, business, and partner topics to help service providers and enterprises build better voice networks. For many contact centers, an interactive voice response system is the first stop for callers, querying the caller for information to help direct their call to the appropriate resource or agent. An effective and reliable IVR automates mundane tasks, speeds resolution, and leaves a lasting branding impression on the caller. Stay with us as Allison Smith, the voice of many voice applications, shares some of her expertise to take IVR systems from good to great. We've got lots to cover, including 10 tips to improve IVR system infrastructure and usability. We'll also share our IVR Hall of Shame entries and have plenty of time for your questions. So let's get going. Uh, first, I want to start with some introductions. I'm Alan Percy. I'm the CMO at Telco Bridges, and I'm really glad to have you all here with us. Uh, and joining us today is Allison Smith. She's the CEO for the IVR Voice. And Allison, uh, you probably heard her, heard her and many, many different voice applications. Uh, and Allison, thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Well, thanks for having me, Alan. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, everybody. Yeah, that's great. Really glad to have you here. It's always a treat. So a uh, quick look at the agenda for today. We're trying to cram this all in in about 30 minutes or so. Uh, we obviously covered our introductions, uh, but we're going to move on and talk about the customer experience and what this, how this IVR affects the customer experience and how it's part of a bigger scope. Uh, then we'll get to our top 10 tips, which I know you're all looking forward to. And then last, uh, then we're going to move on to the Hall of Shame. This is uh, um, one of our um, opportunities to really call out some of the real fails in the IVR world. Uh, and then we're gonna share some information about how to make IVR great, and then uh, we'll wrap up with your questions. And as I mentioned earlier in the opening comments, you know, do feel free to drop your questions or comments as we go along here. And uh, we got that panel open, so we'll keep an eye on it. All right, a um, little introduction about um, uh, Telco Bridges. I did see there's a number of uh, new faces on the uh, line here today. so. I um, wanted to share real briefly a little bit about the company. So um, we are a manufacturer of uh, telecom equipment, including media gateways and SBC software. And we primarily sell to service providers, carriers, and enterprises. Uh, it's uh, an employee-owned company founded in 2002 with about 40 employees, uh, headquartered in Montreal. But as you can imagine, most everyone's been working from home the last few months. Uh, with all the development being done there in, in Montreal with uh, support and service offices in Poland, Turkey, Hong Kong, and I work for my home office uh, in Buffalo, New York. And we provide 24 seven technical, technical support through those offices with uh, support agents um, working around the globe. We've got a great uh, logo selection of uh, design wins that we've uh, accumulated over the years. Uh, many of them are global service providers and the reasons a lot of them uh, chose Telco Bridges is because of the reliability and service quality uh, and many of the technology innovations. And some of those we'll talk about as we go through some of the IVR tips and tricks that are real differentiators. So Allison, why don't you tell us a little bit about your business and um, your background to help us get started. Sure. Uh, yes, so my company is called the IVRvoice.com. And I voice, engineer, and produce telephone prompts, call center prompts, and AI prompts as well. So I'm heard on numerous platforms pretty much globally. If you can go to the next slide, there's a little bit of a, oh, sorry, yes. Yep. I am the voice of the Asterisk Open Source PBX. I'm probably best known for that work, but this is a, a brief uh, overview of some of the platforms that I voice for. So Cisco Meraki, Mitel, uh, Hawaiian Telecom, uh, even some of the Bells. So it's pretty exciting. And next slide. Uh, so this is like a little truncated list of some of my regular clients. So PetSmart is a huge client of mine. Uh, Samsung Canada, I do all of their outward facing IVR, Kennedy Space Center, got a really good group of clients that uh, enlist my services regularly. And next slide. Uh, the other exciting news is that I'm being developed very slowly. It's a slow process, 
but I'm being developed as an upgrade voice for Amazon Alexa on specific survey applications. So the idea is you go shopping at Costco or Best Buy and you come home, kick off your shoes, activate your system and take a short survey, which you're more inclined to do, I think, than doing the, uh, you know, logging onto their website and doing the, uh, the survey that way. So that's extremely exciting. So yeah, in addition to... Win. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, so in addition to voicing IVR... I've become a blogger and a speaker on issues of improving telephone systems and making sure that telephone systems reflect companies' brands. So this is why we're here today is hopefully to improve the way that people design IVR and uh, call center prompts. Great. Well, that's great. All right, let's just get started with uh, customer experience. And and one of the things we wanted to point out, I think is important, and Alice and I were chatting before we uh, put this event together, is how important it is to, to think of IVR as one piece of a bigger puzzle, is that you know there's a holistic experience between a consumer or a customer and the vendor um, that ranges from the first moment that they engage either on a website or an in-person or on the telephone but all these interactions all work to create a customer experience. And, you know, a good quality customer experience rate is statistically shown to improve satisfaction. Uh, more importantly, also with loyalty and repeat business, uh, you know, with recommendations, for example, you know, it, as we all know, you get all these surveys that um, after the purchase about whether or not um, you were satisfied with a particular product or, or an exchange with a vendor, and all this leads towards, you know, improving your position within the marketplace. So we wanted to just kind of point out that IVR is just one of the pieces of the bigger puzzle. Uh, we found an a, a interesting survey. Um, uh, USAN reported that uh, more than 8 in 10 respondents said that companies will lose their business after a bad, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, respondents said that companies will lose their business after a bad IVR experience. I think we've all had this experience. We all remember it. It's um, it's glaringly obvious when you've got stuck in you know in an IVR jail, uh, bad menus. You've had to sit on hold too long. You've had to listen to bad music on hold too long. All yeah. these kinds of things accumulate, and I think that the um, you know Allison, you know, we've we've all run into these, right? <laughs> We have, and I think that's just a staggeringly high number. If you can afford to lose eight out of ten of your customers, uh, you know it's it's really it, it portends very badly. So think of your IVR almost like the the welcome mat or the opening gateway to your company, and it, it's unfortunately often neglected. So we're here to improve that. And, and I think we were talking uh, yesterday during our kind of walkthrough, we were talking about the, you know, the experience where if I have to pick up the phone to call a company, it's usually not the first thing I think of. Right? Usually you start at the right. web yeah. and you work your way through. And then when you call, it's usually serious at this point. <laughs> yeah, it usually means that the customer has not found the solution to their issue on their website. I think people will go to the website first, don't you? If you have an issue with a product, you probably go to their website first. And if your issue is not in their FAQs on their website, that's usually when you resort to picking up the phone. So yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, people yeah. are pretty turnkey and they wanna come to, to a resolution to their problem themselves. So if, if they end up picking up the phone to ask for a live human's help, you know, it, they should be facilitated in that venture. Right. Yep. And uh, and the, one of the worst things that you do first thing in your IVR is tell them to go to the web because they probably <laughs> already were there. <laughs> so. They've already been there. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's go take a look at our top 10 and how we mm -hmm. position this is uh, I asked Elsa to bring uh, five of her top and I put together five of, of my top 10 uh, issues that um, help improve IVR from a technical standpoint. So um, from infrastructure and technical side and Allison's providing some from the, the voicing and the menuing and structure side. So let's get started with that. All right, so number 10 is uh, for me is uh, about the importance of being cloud ready, all right? Uh, um, IVR is one of many applications that traditionally has been uh, an on-premise enterprise kind of application 
but many of these things are moving to the cloud. It's very, very important that whatever technologies you choose to help make your IVR come to fruition are cloud ready. So either you um, can move them to the cloud or already have them in the cloud. And this um, gives you many benefits uh, from the software as a service business model uh, where you can pay as you grow, uh, but it also provides greater resilience, which we'll talk about in a couple more slides. And then uh, also uh, making sure that it's platform agnostic so that uh, if you work with one particular cloud provider and decide to move on or can find a lower cost option, you've got options as to where to move your, your IVR platform. And many of these things are th considerations that we've put into uh, some of our products. And as we uh, go on, we'll talk about that some more. All right, number nine, Allison, this is all you. Okay. So yes, number nine is enforce your brand. So I always ask clients of mine to think about the idea of does your IVR or call center prompts actually reflect your company's personality? A good example is I've voiced for banks and financial institutions. And the way that voice talent used to approach that was, oh, this must be very serious. Money and investments are serious. I'm finding more and more banks are looking for a very casual, friendly, uh, personable tone, uh, almost uh, with the attitude of, yes, investments are scary. We're going to help you through it, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, question your company's position in your industry and make sure that your IVR reflects what your company is all about. And, and if it doesn't, why not? Take a chance in your phone system and actually design your prompts to accurately reflect who you are. And the choice of the voice talent and the style of writing of the actual script will uh, inform how it turns out. So a, a lot of people will say to me, we want the prompts to sound very conversational and very uh, personable. Act like you're just talking to your best friend. Well, if they're not written in that style, it makes that goal of having the prompts be very candid. It makes that very, very difficult to achieve. So make sure that your choice of voice talent and the style of the writing and the direction of your voice talent. It's always a good idea for you to give your talent some idea of the mood and the feel that you're trying to create. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I can imagine uh, if you really miss the mark with the, with the, the brand, um, you might leave people off. You know, they, yes. would, be, they would feel maybe, maybe I didn't pick the right bank or didn't pick the right partner. Right. They don't seem to align with my needs or interests or... Or, or exactly. Okay. Yeah. You know, a, a good example was a small chain of dry cleaners that I voiced their IVR for. And they came back and they said, listen, uh, you sound too fancy and you sound too <laughs> formal. So they actually really just wanted sort of a casual neighborhood cleaner sound. So mm -hmm. uh, they regretted not giving me that information to begin with, but I was able to modify it and, and just sound like somebody local. Oh, so. that's great. Yeah. Good. All right. Number eight, planning for scalability. So we we all hope that our, whatever our solution is that we're building is going to be wildly popular, whether it be, you know, a hosted solution at a contact center uh, to announcements for a, uh, you know, a large service provider project. Uh, but there's all different cases where IVR needs to be scalable. And that includes, you know, seasonal projects. So you can imagine, uh, some of the, uh, you know, the retail and online stores have seasonal surges. Um, they could be campaign specific, right? If you uh, initiate maybe a new email campaign for, you know, for people to sign up for new cable offering or something like that, you know, you need to make sure that when people do pick up the phone to call in that it, that the solution can scale to meet, you know, the peaks that you might expect. But there's also the unexpected traffic. And one of the use cases that we've talked about in one of our previous events was about um, having a, um, a public safety and public service line that um, could handle, uh, you know, community concerns. And when things like earthquakes or floods or, you know, other uh, natural disasters occur, you suddenly were faced, they were certainly faced with these huge surges of incoming calls and needed to be able to do load balancing and spread this traffic across multiple IVR systems as they go. And this is one of the important pieces that they used our session border controller for to be able to spread this load 
and better manage it so that it didn't overrun any one of the systems and they were able to service as many customers as possible. So give that some consideration. You know, plan for scalability. Think ahead. Uh, what about um, you know, these we call call tsunamis uh, that might happen? All right. Number seven is, uh, is engage. Yes. Okay. So this is a really important one. So there are certain cliches that show up in phone systems that people sort of feel like they need to write into their IVR because they hear it all the time. You know which ones I'm talking about. So there's things like, please listen to the entire menu before making your selection. Don't tell the caller what to do. Um, you know, things like that. Um, so there are cliches that probably don't need to be written in there. So avoid any of those things that really don't serve the IVR. You should also use your IVR for more than just sorting callers. When I started voicing IVR for TELUS, which is the big telephony concern up here in Alberta, um, they explained it to me uh, as though it's almost like sorting people that are coming up an escalator and all the people with the white jackets go off to the right and then you sort all the people with the blue jackets off to the, to the left and then everyone else in miscellaneous colors go straight forward to be sorted further down the line. And I thought that was a good visualization for what an IVR does. It does, it sorts callers so that your call center staff and that, you know, your staff in general uh, is best used solving the problems that they're best trained for. But IVR should be used for so much more than just sorting callers. It, as, as I said in the previous slide, it is for reflecting your, your brand. So take some chances with your IVR. Write something that perhaps you don't hear all the time. And I, I promise that listeners of the system, your callers, We'll, we'll really make note of that and go, wow, that's, that's a little bit unusual. That's interesting. And the last point there is entertain with a question mark. So whether or not it's appropriate for your company to make it slightly humorous or entertaining, that would be up to you. And that's, that's sort of a judgment call. But I sort of um, encourage my clients to think about ways in which you can actually engage and entertain the caller not in a smarmy way, not in a way that sort of overtakes the purpose of the call. But yeah, I, I try to move people more towards thinking about IVR as a way of enhancing and entertaining. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I have to admit the one or two times I've hit something that surprised me, uh, it was probably along in those lines of engaging. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. So number six, uh, build for reliability. Uh, you know, IVR in a lot of cases is going to be, as Allison said, the front door and uh, the point of entry for an awful lot of uh, business. And so you need to be cognizant of what would happen if this were to go down. You know, what's your survivability plan? What kind of geographic diversity have you built as part of your solution? And ensuring that there's this no single point of failure and having access to high availability in one plus one infrastructure, we think is a big piece of this. And this gives uh, points of entry in through whether it's through media gateways or session border controllers coming off SIP trunks, uh, some additional reliability so that if, uh, you know, a piece of equipment or a virtual machine or, you know, any one of a number of other things that can go wrong happens that the uh, IVR can stay up and continue to handle calls. Uh, no matter the situation. And I think we've all run into situations where businesses, um, um, more recently, there's been a couple of uh, cyber hacks and uh, completely taken the business out, out of, out of uh, you, know, pre, you know, their virtual presence just disappeared. And it's, um, it's pretty disheartening when that happens. Yeah. All right, number five, respect. Oh, so important. So, it, it seems apparent, and all you need to do is think about maybe the last time that you were on a very frustrating call. Uh, it just felt like you weren't respected. It felt like you were actually doing the work for the company by calling in. So value the caller, value their time, and value their patience, both of which are in short supply. So be sincere. Don't lie. Don't underestimate the amount of time that they're going to get to a live agent. Don't tell them things like, you're the next caller in line, which everyone knows is not true. So uh, don't get their hopes up with false platitudes like that. And uh, the interesting thing to explore is to uh, make a vow to get them through the process as quickly 
and as win-win as possible. Quickly, obviously, is axiomatic. Uh, You don't want to have too many prompts that overwhelm the caller. And also, it's a win-win if the caller is not frazzled by the time they get to a live agent. So it's a win for the caller, and it's a win for the company as well if you keep the prompts as simple and as easy to use as possible. So you mean uh, if if you could have an IVR system that was brutally honest, it would might sound like, <laughs> well, your call is not the next one in line, <laughs> We, you know, or your call is important to us, but not as important as the workforce <laughs> management system, who's yeah. unfortunately understaffed today. And therefore, you're probably <laughs> going to sit on hold for a significant period of time before you finally give up and go to the website like we told you to in the beginning. Yes. You know, years ago, I did a mock on hold system for Mark Spencer, who invented the asterisk system. And it was yeah. all about how you are not the next caller in line. So it starts okay. off like a traditional on hold system. And then basically, I have a bit of a breakdown and I say, listen, you know what? The chances of you getting service today are minimal. Hang up, go yeah. spend time with your children, go out in the <laughs> sunshine, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, no, I'm not an advocate of you being honest and saying, you know what? We're not going to get to you for two or three hours. But I'm also not a fan of saying, uh, we'll be with you in a moment when you're not going to be with them in a moment. Well, you you know, know, an example maybe would be good is, you know, I have run into contact centers that say, um, you know, we are um, experiencing high call volume. uh, And, and, you know, there's then what are the remedies, right? One of the remedies is you call back at some other time. Yes. Another remedy is go to the website. Another remedy is to go to the chat bot, you know, these other kinds of things. So, you know, being honest and just saying, hey, listen, we got a lot of call volume here today. And unfortunately, we're going to deflect you. You know, Ellen, another uh, popular one is if you would like to leave your number, you will not lose your place in line. So you get this automated callback. Now, that's, I've taken advantage of that a couple of times, and they've called me back and put me into another queue. queue. Yep. Not yep. fair. That's not good. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I've, I've been in the exact same situation. Yeah. 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 Builds great customer experience. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to number four, deliver high quality. And uh, this is some, um, you know, a, a comprehensive uh, question or issue here. So it's not only about the quality of the of the voice that you use. Thank you, Allison. Thank but you. also the actual delivery of the voice. Uh, you know, the voice quality, of course, is very important. Um, it's a lot more than just a branding issue. Uh, the quality of the voice also affects you know, comprehension and retention of the user, right? So if the caller calls in and they can't quite exactly make out what you're saying, or it's confusing or said too fast, or if the caller maybe is English as a second language and is having difficulty discerning what you're trying to tell them, uh, obviously that doesn't help the situation. But also too, you know, good high quality voice helps with voice recognition. A lot of IVR systems now are voice a- voice activated. And that, um, you know, that little uh, crispy crunchiness that's in the voice when it um, is not delivered with high reliability, um, completely messes up those voice recognition engines. And so um, it's really, really important that you can measure the quality of the voice as it comes off the SIP trunk providers. And you may choose uh, based on that quality, not to use a provider, or maybe it's a traffic issue on some part of your network. Um, and we kind of boil it down to, if you know, if you can't fix it, you can't measure, or let's see, if you can't fix it, if you can't measure it. So yeah. it's, um, It's really important, and this is why we built into our media gateways and session border controllers, you know, built-in mean opinion score measurement that occurs, you know, ongoing with every call and logs it so that you can go back and look for a particular trunk group, you know, what kind of voice quality am I getting? Am I uh, improving my IVR quality by having a good voice quality? Absolutely. And, you know, Alan, further to that thought, when people get a phone system, they just want to get it up and running. And often they will just get someone in their office, an office staffer, to voice their opening greeting and their after hours greeting. And they're voicing it over a handset. So yeah. what is your opinion of that quality? It, it shows very little concern is what it tells me. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. As a matter of fact, we get to our hall of shame. Uh, <laughs> we have a story about that. Yes. <laughs> All right, number three, clarity, which is we put these next to each other on purpose. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, so clarity. Uh, so it's really important that your choices in your menu are not too similar. I think we've all been in that situation where you're listening to a menu and you think it might be choice number one that you need, but it could be a little bit of choice number two. And oh my gosh, what do I do if I pick the wrong choice? Do I have to go through the whole process again? So when you're designing your IVR prompts, make sure that the choices are not too similar. Uh, again, I can't harp on this enough narrow it down to the top five reasons that someone would call your company. Any more than five choices, I don't think the human brain remembers or even comprehends what those choices were. Um, don't confuse the caller. This sort of goes hand in hand with that. And map out a path for service that's easy for them to follow. Again, setting them up for success and not overwhelming them. The other thing I wanna mention is that if you offer any kind of emergency support or if your prompts are for a medical situation and there's a chance that somebody's calling in and they're actually in distress, make sure that you have any emergency or frequently used prompts front stacked at the top of the menu and they go down in importance. I always tell this example of voicing for a cardiology clinic in Florida and there was about 13 options, way too many. And the very final option was, if this is a medical emergency, hang up and dial 911. Terrible. Absolutely yeah, terrible. I should have been first. Yes, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. All right. Number two is test, 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 right? So this is um, uh, one of the things I think sometimes gets overlooked a little bit is, is looking uh, at the DTMF detection as part of the task procedure is, you know, the, a lot of the devices that we use to communicate, uh, you know, we obviously use push buttons for a lot of it. In some cases we use voice recognition, but, you know, if, they, if it misinterprets a key press or if it inadvertently hears one key press as two uh, or, you know, any other issues happen, it is extremely confusing for the user. And one of the issues really struggles now is with mobile devices. You know, a lot of the mobile devices now, you have to do something to get the keypad to come up now. And then on top of it, when you do select a key, it only sends a very short burst of the DTMF tone to the yeah. uh, destination. And in some cases, depending on the, you know, the technology you've used to detect those tones, it can miss those very short bursts uh, or misinterpret them, or in some cases, um, detect them as two of the same digit. Uh, and some of this is a side effect of DTMF, what's called DTMF transcoding. This is the conversion of DTMF tones from the in-band sound that you hear to a set of SIP messages that might be delivered uh, to the application at the far end. So doing this performance testing to verify the quality of the DTMF detection is critically important. And we've run into a number of situations where uh, customers were having real DTMF problems and we were able to correct them by using uh, some of the features that are built into uh, our session border controller and our media server functions. So. Um, this, you know, we've discovered this the hard way for customers and they're able to resolve it. So it's important. All right. Number one, brevity. Oh gosh, keep it short. <laughs> so as I said previously, callers, patients, and attention span is in short supply and so is their time. Yeah. So uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned limit the number of options, five, I would say the very most uh, and keep the choices concise, not too confusing. And again, don't make them too similar. Think about the last time that you were trying to navigate through an IVR that was confusing and almost maze-like. Let's not design those and uh, set the caller up for success. And that's nice and brief. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes, that is really critical. I think it's a, a very important, you know, really look at the words when you put together the script and make a decision about does this word really need to be there? Is there a better way to say it that's brief yep. and to the point? Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. And now I know what you've all been waiting for <laughs> is the IVR Hall of Shame. And uh, what I did is Allison and I went through our personal experiences and projects that we've worked on for various times and came up with uh, kind of the worst of the worst. And uh, I'm going to lead off with my doctor's office. I have one of my doctors that I work with that I call, have to call fairly frequently 
the, uh, and it's clear that the prompts were recorded by the technician that installed it. So as <laughs> Allison hinted, you could tell, you could hear it. He must have been in the back closet someplace, and he just picked up a handset <laughs> and pressed the number of DTMF keys to get into an admin menu and recorded the opening uh, introduction. And sure enough, starts out with the number one. He says, you know, if this is an emergency, you know, call 911 and hang up. But then right after that, he guess what he says? Yeah. The menu choices have changed. Please listen to this entire prompt. And it's just like, dude, come on. It's been months this has been up. We, we get it. Yeah. Uh, he also speaks too fast and without natural pause or inflection. He just, just blurts out these sentences. He didn't, it's clear he didn't stop and read it over or speak it out loud a few times before actually recording it. And then on top of it, when you do finally get through all that and you have to sit on hold waiting for someone to answer the phone, is that there's a very short uh, music on hold that repeats every so many seconds, but it does stick in the dreaded, your call is important, please <laughs> hold while we, and you just, you want to reach to the phone and strangle them. So anyway, yeah. Um, and then last but not least is you uh, get frustrated and hit zero. Yeah. Well, guess what it does? It goes right to the opening menu when you hit Got zero. It doesn't it. Nope, go to Not somebody. fair. That, that no, should not, not be fair. allowed. <laughs> yeah. That should be uh, that's a kernel sin. So <laughs> that is I awful. nominate my doctor's office for the hall of shame. Well, and you know, Alan, I, I talked to a lot of resellers of phone systems and they've all voiced these prompts for their customers thinking it was just going to be a stopgap thing and they're yeah. going to replace it with real prompts and 20 years later, they're still yeah. on the system. Yeah. So get a pro to do it. It's not expensive and, you know, we're always available for updates and changes. Oh, that's astounding. That's painful. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to your nomination. Okay, so I mentioned the cardiology clinics IVR with the, uh, the medical thing being the very last thing. Bad, very, very bad. Um, my own bank um, will ask for my PIN number three different times and in three different ways. I have to say it verbally. I have to key it in, DTMF, and then uh, I think another verbal thing. So it's, it's crazy. That it, there shouldn't be that many levels of checks to make sure that you're still the person calling. Right. Um, so this is, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a hall of shame thing, but this illustrates your tsunami or load balancing thing. One of the Astros guys had a very serious phone menu, but he did put in an option, press nine for a cold beer. Huh. And it, it created a tsunami. It, it blew their circuits out. So, um, uh, you know, I, I was talking about interjecting humor. It's fun, yeah. but that, that actually caused an issue with his disruptive food. almost. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I mentioned when we were doing our little run through was, um, so there's a major appliance manufacturer, which will remain nameless, but they do a lot of kitchen stuff. Uh, they had literally seven layers of options. So seven, uh, a main menu, and then six sub menus and three check-ins to see if I'd learned French yet. So at the beginning, they established, do you want English or French? Press English. I live in Western Canada. We don't speak French here. Uh, and then as I got into a couple of other sub menus, they had the French English option again, which was so frustrating. Yeah. And only to find out that they don't actually service the pasta maker that I was calling about to begin with. So <laughs> I was about an hour out of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's awful. I it know, is. the experience too. Yeah. yeah. In fact, one of the questions is a great, great, great one. We'll spend a moment on that one. Mm -hmm. All right, listen, I want to spend just a minute and talk about some of the solutions uh, that are available to help improve uh, IVR. Uh, as you know, um, Telco Bridges has a great portfolio that includes both signaling and media gateways. Uh, and these media gateways have uh, DSP farms in them to improve DTMF quality, do voice quality measurement, these kinds of things that we've talked about in today's call our session border controllers do a lot of that load balancing they're virtualized so they can scale and go in the cloud uh, and they're a great piece of uh, uh, any solution for uh, delivering high quality ivr uh, we also have uh, our video library is a great resource so we want to remind you you know this and 31 previous uh, live events are recorded uh, and posted on the uh, on the uh, youtube library and you can get it at that with youtube.com slash telco bridges. And I uh, want to strongly encourage you to, you know, to subscribe to that. And then that'll help uh, keep you updated on 
on what's available for future sessions. You'll get a chance to go back and listen to some of the other ones, but also some how-to tutorials, some customer interviews, our um, uh, online training is uh, available on the channel. So there's lots of resources there. I want to encourage you to leverage that. So um, we're going to leave up our contact information for Allison and myself, and we'll get to the Q&A panel here. Um, so I see a couple of questions here uh, that popped in. And so uh, one of our attendees asked a question about visual IVR. What do you think about visual IVR? And maybe a little bit of background on that. So visual IVR is a tool, and I don't know, Allison, if you ever experienced this before, but visual IVR is where when you go into a into an uh, interaction with an IVR system, that it activates an app or a web session on your on your mobile device that gives you the choices uh, visually in addition to you know, verbally. So yeah. um, one of the benefits is is it kind of gives it to in two different forms so that it sinks in a little bit better to your brain. Yeah. But it also gives you the option of using the application without actually hearing, right? So it gives, um, you know, not only the hearing disabled, but also in situations where maybe listening to your phone might not be the best thing. You know, you're on a train, you're in a noisy environment, uh, and right. with that visual IVR, you can interact with it. Have you, have you worked on any one of the visual IVR uh, platforms? You know, I haven't. It could be that they take my prompts and also put them into a visual form. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of bad news for someone like myself, especially if it's not in tandem with the spoken prompts. But right. I totally understand that there's some occasions, just like you mentioned, where it doesn't make sense to play the audio. Um, I personally like the idea, and I think probably the brain responds great if you're seeing it and hearing it at the same time. Right. To me, I think that would be a, a win for me to be able to have both of those hemispheres of the brain uh, engaged yep. at the same time. Yeah. 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 No, I think we're visual anyhow, so it, it helps to read at the same time. Yeah, it's yeah. A, a very innovative tool. And I saw a few demos, um, I think, at the Mobile World Congress a couple of years ago um, where, you know, you would call into a number and then would, they would immediately text you back a link and then you'd touch that link and it would open the visual experience on your, on your yes. device. So, yeah, yeah, handy little tool. Good. Yeah. All right. So, uh, David asked a question. So, why do companies insist on asking for uh, some code, you know, your, your PIN, your zip code, whatever it might be, your account code? only to ask for it again when you finally reach the agent. So um, there's a number of reasons for that. And uh, it's, first of all, everyone agrees, show of hands, it's annoying as can be. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, there seems to be there's two reasons. One of them is this, what's called a non-integrated IVR. And what that means is when you're in the IVR experience, you, you've provided that uh, information and the IVR can then pull up records and maybe tell you things like your account balance and these kinds of things. But when it actually transfers the call to an agent, that that number, that account number uh, is lost in doing that transfer over to the actual live agent uh, system. Hmm. Uh, that's what they call a non-integrated IVR. And um, a number of the co contact center platform vendors um, have fortunately, thank God, um, closed that gap uh, and use technology to make it so that that session that you initiate on the phone um, is then, you know, the, the uh, you know, the account number or the PIN number or whatever it is you had to enter gets passed along to the agent. And so when the screen pop comes to the agent, they don't need to ask that question again. Yeah. I mean, you just sort of presume that if you get transferred to another agent, you're going to have that continuity, including you having verified that you are who you are. Sure. So. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Mm. And then this, yeah, the second piece is that it's a it, it's a validation, right? There's, yeah. Um, I I think some of the IVR systems and some of the contact centers, there's um, possible ways that um, someone could get in, uh, and um, you know, they lose track of who you are, and so they're just trying to verify who you are. It's much like when you go to the doctor's office; they always ask your date of birth to make yes. sure they got the right person. I think it's kind of that in yeah. in some cases. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's it's just kind of a confirmation. So absolutely. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. So another question here. Rodrigo asks, um, "What are the advantage of uh, integrating IVR with platforms such as Google ASR? So um, oh. using speech re recognition and and using cloud-based speech recognition, not only just Google, but I know Nuance and a number of others offer that." Yeah. 
Um, yeah, that's one of the great things of being cloud-based is you can use these uh, separate platforms and use the you know the best of those platforms to build your your solution. Um, you know, maybe maybe the Google ASR is you know best of breed for your particular situation or the particular language that you're working in, uh, and um, you can pull that in and use a uh, use their APIs to in- integrate it into your into your IVR. So yeah, um, I, you know, I, I always great. have concerns uh, concerns about how seamless that will sound. Hopefully, it's not too um, right. choppy. But um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't think there's any reason why they can't play nicely together and integrate well. Yep. Yeah. Whatever you do, don't use their text to speech though. Use a real <laughs> live voice. <laughs> You're so good to me, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway. So Tommy asks, how likely a person uh, how likely a person would like to speak to an uh, to an interactive voice bot. So, you know, instead of uh, um, you know, eventually speaking to a person, they're going to have a two-way conversation with a voice bot. And I don't, and this is maybe somewhat like your Amazon project, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it, that legendary uh, demo from Google with the hairdressing appointment, probably everybody's seen that video where somebody is calling into a salon and it's actually a bot that's taking the call. And it was so realistic that they were saying, um, you know, can, can I get in for a trim on Tuesday? And the bot is saying, ooh, um, Tuesday were full. How are you for Wednesday morning though? And it was that natural and it was uh, wow. a little spooky because yeah. it, it really did have all of the human cadences. Yep. Um, so my experience with uh, both the Kepstrel text to speech voice that I've done and um, you know, other AI projects that I've worked on is that there's always a little bit something off with the cadence so that you will always know that it's a little bit of a manufactured voice. It's getting better. And with the, uh, you know, the Alexa stuff that I'm working on, we're really after an extremely relaxed, very conversational tone without being obsequious. So it really is kind of a creative process to strike that balance between bot, you know, unfeeling Android and um, an actual person sounding AI. So. Well, we've all seen uh, on the internet the bot interaction uh, spoof where somebody uh, was texting or chatting with what they thought was a bot and right. was using sexually explicit language with the bot. <laughs> and the bot eventually wasn't a bot. It was a real human. And the person said, dude, I'm a real person. Cut it out. <laughs> so it's worth a good chuckle. That's so, awesome. Anyway. <laughs> Yep. All right. On that note, uh, we're, we've reached the end of our list. And uh, so first, Allison, I want to thank you so much for sharing some of your time today. And Thanks for having expertise. me, Alan. Well, yeah. Glad to have you. Hopefully we can have you back sometime soon. I'd love it. Yep. And I want to thank also to all our attendees. I appreciate very much uh, your attention and time today. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're going to send out that email. and would love to have you share it with your friends and uh, coworkers and uh, spread the word. So with that, I'm going to say have a great day. And that's it from here. <laughs>